All right. Good afternoon, everybody. We have a lot to cover today. I think it was a week or, or two ago, uh, we talked about March 14th as a uh, date when Kentuckians could expect more guidance uh, and change guidance, given uh, where we are now in this pandemic. Well, the CDC came out with a lot of new guidance on Friday. Through a lot of hard work, Dr. Stack has uh, already analyzed all of that and is prepared to offer our new guidance today uh, based in large part on uh, how the CDC is now measuring the relative danger in individual counties and areas. So I'm going to go through uh, where we are right now in the pandemic, and then we're going to hear a lot from Dr. Stack about what the CDC uh, now looks at and how our guidance is going to change for the general public, as well as K through 12, uh, based on that new CDC guidance uh, and the new metrics that they are using. First, let's talk about how COVID continues to decline at a significant rate. That's really good news. Saturday, 1,602 new cases, but still we are seeing a lot of deaths, 42 new deaths. They include a 39-year-old man from Fleming County, a 32-year-old man from Letcher County, a 49-year-old man from Nelson County. So remember, we're still losing people that are far too young. On Sunday, 481 new cases, 22 new deaths. Um, they include a 21-year-old from Jefferson County and a 49-year-old from Jessamine County. And then today, 671 new cases, 34 uh, new deaths, including a 22-year-old woman from Fleming County. Uh, again, far too young, a 42-year-old man from Bullock County. But a good news today, positivity rate, 8.56%. It continues to fall, just like our case numbers. And we're under 1,000 people currently in the hospital. With COVID, it's now 962, 203 people in the ICU, 112 people on ventilators. Uh, the stair-stepper chart that we always show is dramatic. It shows that, yes, cases are falling nearly as quickly as they rose in this Omicron surge. What we really want to see is this continue to fall. Uh, remember, between Alpha and Delta, we had a really good summer, right? The cases fell significantly and they stayed uh, really, really far down. Between Delta and Omicron, we didn't get that. In fact, they fell pretty close to where we are today before they started to dramatically increase again. Are we all good with the video? So um, again, this is really good news. The pace of the decline continues to be significant. We want to continue to see these numbers going down. Right now, there's no reason to think that they won't. Uh, let's look at the positivity rate, stair-stepper chart as well. Again, you can see uh, this continuing to fall. Uh, we're now dropping, oh, about a half a point, uh, percentage point a day, maybe a little bit less but it is a continuing steady decline. Uh, and remember, cases tend to decline when we have less of the disease. Uh, so we'll see how this stair-stepper chart continues to match up with the overall number of cases. Uh, hospitalizations continuing to, to fall and fall significantly. Again, let's look at the difference between alpha and delta. Alpha really being the first major spike, delta being the second and Omicron being the third. We want to get back down to the levels that we saw um, after the, the Alpha variant where we had very few people in the hospital. Look, it got under 500. Really, it got under, what, 250. Now, that did not happen between Delta and Omicron. And while we were getting close to uh, where we stopped declining in Delta and before the Omicron increase, we want to see uh, this chart certainly uh, decline, uh, continuing uh, into the next, not just weeks, but months. Uh, ICUs, we're seeing the same uh, general decline. 
again, you can see the same trend. Now we wanna get back down to where we were um, certainly last summer. And if we can, that'll make for a great spring and summer this year. And finally, um, Kentuckians on a ventilator. Um, because of the way Omicron hits people as opposed to Delta, it never reached the, the same height here. Um, but we certainly, again, want to see a full decline uh, and not a plateau uh, and or an increase uh, or, or a relatively quick increase like we did uh, between the last two surges. As of today, 388 National Guard men and women in our hospitals and or food banks. Um, we anticipate that it's likely that they will not be needed by March the 15th. Uh, so that is our current, <coughs> excuse me, uh, date that we're looking at uh, there. Uh, vaccines. If there's one negative piece of information today, it's that our vaccination numbers um, are dropping about as quickly uh, as the virus itself, just under 1,400 people getting vaccinated for the first time over the weekend. That is really low, uh, less than 2,500 people getting boosted. However, slow and steady does mean something. When we look at the overall demographics, now 2,800,000. 82,345 people with at least one shot. We went up a percentage and the overall number of Kentuckians, that's up 64 to 65%. We are now close to two thirds of every man, woman, and child in the Commonwealth having at least one shot. And then James, if you wanna go through all of them, the only one that increased were five to 11 year olds, increased one percentage point to 22%. All right, another big uh, step. Effective tomorrow, March 1st, 2022, state government will be transitioning uh, from requiring our employees to wear masks to it being optional, as well as for visitors in executive branch buildings and offices and in state vehicles when another employee is present. However, we do have a number of facilities that are congregate care type facilities that will need to keep requiring masks to protect those that we serve or our employees. Those are groups like the Kentucky Department of Veterans Affairs Nursing Homes, Department of Corrections, our correctional institutions, our psychiatric hospitals under the Cabinet for Health and Family Services, and immediate care facilities, agencies providing food, beverage, and housekeeping services, and other congregate settings as determined by an agency uh, under the appointing authority to our state employees. Uh, thank you. Thank you for holding on this long. Uh, and thank you for your success. Uh, thanks for your willingness, thanks to your willingness to do this. We didn't have one major Omicron outbreak that required us to stop providing a service for any period of time uh, during the most contagious virus we've seen in my lifetime. We were able to serve the public every single day uh, based on so many of you as state employees getting vaccinated, but also being willing to take that extra step to protect our workforce, even if you weren't concerned about your own health, uh, just knowing that we were ensuring that person beside you were more likely to be able to come in to work the next day. I've also asked each of our employees to be real thoughtful about their personal safety and to feel empowered in their decision-making. If you have a pre-existing condition, you probably ought to continue to wear a mask and we wanna support you to do that. If you're comfortable still wearing a mask and wanna to continue to do so, uh, maybe somebody at home uh, is vulnerable. We want to support you in doing so. And it's not uh, just an either or decision on any given day. People should be thinking about each individual action and or meeting or, or event that they're going to. You know, here in the Capitol, uh, most of the time you'll see me probably wearing a mask if you see me going through the hallways or going to a big event. I probably won't be in private meetings in my office. So we truly want the, the public, now that we have all this information, the ability to get vaccinated, good masks that work, just to be really thoughtful. And my thought process, it's going to be uh, everything from size of a group to, to do I know their vaccination status, to worrying about um, those in my family that certainly have not had COVID and, and wanted to protect 
them and myself having not had COVID, uh, depending on the, the situation that we are in. So I'd ask everybody, as you get new guidance, support one another. You know, negative social pressure can be really hard. And it might push people to take off uh, a mask when they need to be wearing them. And if you're somebody that's been fired up about your freedom not to wear a mask, it's certainly someone's freedom to wear a mask. And I've heard people yelling at other people just for making a decision that they think protects them. You know, let's respect their individual autonomy and choices. Uh, let's make sure uh, that we are respectful and supportive. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Stack, who has a whole lot to go over, uh, and then we'll come back with a few other pieces of news. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, Kentucky. So as the governor has uh, reviewed, the metrics are all continuing to move in the right direction, and they're moving uh, very quickly in the right direction, which is a positive development. We're happy to see that. As we look to the third year of the pandemic, we've arrived at a very different place at this point. Now we have effective vaccines. We have testing pretty readily available all over the state. We have treatments, and we also have vaccines that can prevent most all the serious harms of the uh, virus at this point in time. And as a result of that, uh, we now are transitioning further as we have all along this journey uh, to different guidance and to different things that we're measuring that are hopefully more relevant and help to inform our decision-making process going forward. So if I could have the first slide, please. So our guidance, CDC's and Kentucky Department for Public Health can largely be boiled down to a few basic things we all need to do for the foreseeable future. So the first is please get vaccinated. The governor shared that the vaccine rates for new people getting vaccinated have fallen off and the number of people showing up to get boosted has declined. It is really, really important that you get vaccinated if you have not already, and that you keep up to date on your vaccine by getting boosted when boosters are recommended. So particularly for those who are vulnerable, for those who are over 60 or have multiple medical problems, you definitely wanna make sure you get up to date on your vaccinations if you're eligible for a booster. So please do that. The other things are all of us, and this is even pre-COVID, if you are sick, please stay home. If you have a fever, if you really feel crummy, don't spread any disease, not just COVID. So if you're sick, please stay home until you feel better. Or if you test positive for COVID, please stay home for the period of time we recommend, which is five days. And then we ask you that you wear a mask for five further days in public to lower your risk of transmitting disease. And please, the governor went into this at length, so I won't repeat it uh, at length, but we have got to accept that mask use is an appropriate, reasonable, and responsible thing for vulnerable persons to do and for people who are trying to protect vulnerable persons. And so you will see members of the public still wearing masks out of the stores, walking into restaurants, walking through buildings, coming to work. We need to support them and be tolerant of their choice to do that because it's what they can do to help further lower their risk of a disease that could cause them serious harm even if it may not cause you the same magnitude of harm. And then finally, we will continue to provide guidance based on the best science and knowledge that we have available. And we ask you to please consult that and incorporate that into your personal routines as fully as you're able and willing to so that we can try to keep everybody protected. Um, but at this point, now that we're down to um, this level of baseline guidance and we're looking at how we can now live safely with COVID going forward, uh, we're going to also change the things that we measure and use to guide when we make other recommendations. And the CDC, as the governor said, this uh, released a whole lot of information last Friday, the 25th. And so if we could go to the next slide, please. The CDC in 2020 had a paradigm where it used the number of new cases in the community and the test positivity rate as a way to estimate the disease transmission in a community. We've come a very long way in these past two years. They've been able to take the last 18 to 24 months worth of data and model that data and look at which of the metrics we can readily track across the entire nation can best predict when a society or individuals are gonna be at elevated risk either to themselves or for health system collapse as a society. And so they've come up with three different measures. Those three measures are, are shown on this slide and they include two measures for hospital or healthcare capacity. One is the number of um, 
new admissions over a seven day period. The other one is the percent of patients in the hospital who are COVID positive. The second measure has to do with the number of new cases in a specific county. And so they're gonna use these three metrics in an algorithm like this to create a new color coding scheme, which if you could show the next slide, please James, they have already produced on the webpage as of last Friday. So the CDC now has this online and you can go there and hover over your county in Kentucky and you can see what the level of risk is per the CDC's new model, whether you're low, medium or high. Lower down on the CDC's page, they have a series of recommendations that are tied to this. Um, what we're going to notice right now is that we are, as of last week, we were still in the predominantly high-risk category. You're going to see that change quickly this week with the new update and then next week even further as our numbers continue to decline. We're going to take this because the only way you can see this on the federal website is to see the whole country and then zoom in on Kentucky and find your county and translate it into the next thing, James. So they're gonna sh they have the data file available to us and we're gonna map it into our own map, which we will post on KY COVID-19 on our website. We'll take down the incidence rate map so that won't be there anymore and we'll replace it with this community level, COVID-19 community level map. And then we will use that and tie it to James, the next slide, please. New guidance, which we will post up there. So you will see sometime over the next two to three days, the new map appear and this guidance that will go with it as soon as we can get the uh, CDC's data set onto the website. This um, guidance, if you'll notice, is the same basic principles that were on the top level slide I started with. So we need to do things like stay current on our vaccinations, we need to use masks in a targeted fashion at all times for people who are either high risk or people who are in high risk situations or settings. It's only though when we get to the high risk category in the red where we'll recommend universal masking. Um, and, and that is different. That's calibrated very differently than the previous maps we showed. Again, we should always stay home if we're sick or if you test positive for COVID-19. Quarantine will be used in specific circumstances and settings. Uh, but it's not going to be as widespread as it was before. And, and just a point on that, uh, the CDC has messaged this as of last week. The general public should not expect that a local health department will be calling to contact trace you at any point for this going forward or to, Z, to do disease investigation unless there is a specific uh, you know, public health reason to protect a uniquely vulnerable community or population, and they will do those things. But in general, the, the typical member of the public should not expect to receive a phone call from a health department. They are there to be a resource to you, however, and should you have questions or need guidance, by all means, call your local health department and they're happy to help. Um, the uh, other things down here is we do think when we get into the high-risk category, physical distancing still has a role in this manner if you were going to throw a party for a bunch of folks and have 50 or 60 people crammed into a small space and we're in the red category, you might want to rethink that and either move it outside from indoors or consider whether you postpone it until we get to a better place. Uh, and you can also make choices how you behave in public, how close you get to people and how much space you have between each other. Uh, and then high risk individuals will always need at least for the rest of this year, to be mindful of the current situation and what steps they might additionally take for themselves. Uh, next slide, please. Schools are a unique situation. And so we've updated this level of guidance for the schools. We have many pages more of other guidance on the webpage that the K through 12 community has relied upon. Uh, we are revising those these, this week. It takes time to go through all of this material. But you'll notice up here that under all situations, the vaccination, staying home when sick, the isolation if you're a test positive or are sick, and then targeted mask use if there is a certain high risk situations at the school are recommended in all three categories. But it's only when we get to the high or the red category where we strongly recommend universal masking indoors and on the buses. Um, the uh, CDC has changed their guidance and so uh, over this next week or two, schools will be adjusting to match the bus guidance to whatever they're doing in their classrooms. And so uh, there won't be the transportation requirement on all school buses uh, anymore per the CDC's changes. And we urge all schools 
uh, to take advantage of our test to stay program for the balance of this year. We have close to 1500 schools who will use that in 111 counties. And I think at this point, we've probably provided over 1 million COVID-19 tests, the state of Kentucky using federal resources across the Commonwealth. So this uh, is all, uh, this level is updated and I think shared this afternoon with some of the superintendents and more information will follow. And then the final slide, James. Since we're talking about the children in the classroom, I think it's a good time to talk about the multi-inflammatory, uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. This is, uh, we've had about 100 children in Kentucky who've been diagnosed with this. I think this week we will have identified our 100th and I think there's a few more soon following. Um, this condition is rare but serious. It occurs about two to six weeks after the COVID-19 infection itself. Uh, it can occur after mild or even asymptomatic COVID-19. It requires hospitalization. It can be life-threatening. Um, there are, are nationwide nearly 7,000 cases per the CDC and 59 deaths per the CDC. Now, the reason I share this is not because it is uh, overly common, but because there should not be any children who die from this condition, period. And there should not be hardly any children who get it because more and more evidence is showing that the vaccines uh, prevent this in, in large measure. So please, uh, our vaccination rates remain lowest in the school-aged children. I would urge parents to be thoughtful about that. Talk with your pediatrician um, and get your children vaccinated. Uh, so my final remarks, James, you can take that down. Um, we've come a long way as we're finishing up the second year of this pandemic. COVID-19 is not going away. We're gonna have to live with it and learn to live with it and coexist with it but we can do that. We now have abundant testing. We have vaccinations and boosters that can prevent the worst harms of the disease. We have treatments for people who get sick nonetheless. Uh, and we also have um, access to good data and better ways we can recommend guidance like I just shared that are less intrusive, but can still help us to do what we need to do while being safe. I wanna thank you for pulling together and supporting each other. It has been a long two years for everybody. Uh, but we are at a much better place. And as I came over here today with the seemingly near spring-like weather, uh, it is another bright day and I look forward to a wonderful springtime ahead. But thank you very much for your partnership during this journey. Yeah. Thank you to Dr. Stack and thanks for sticking with us uh, through all of it. One of the few people in his position from around the country that has stuck with us and, and with this state the entire uh, two years that we've been dealing with it. And all I'd add is that we can learn to live with COVID, but we can't choose to simply ignore it. Uh, we'll need people to make responsible decisions. We also need to understand that those who refuse to get vaccinated and who refuse to take any other mitigation steps will put themselves and others around them uh, in danger, but that that danger is entirely preventable. It's in your hands to do the smart thing to protect yourself and your family. And we need people to do the smart thing to protect themselves and their family. And we will continue to be patient and offer vaccines to anybody who wants one, boosters to those willing to get them and to ultimately meet the needs, especially of congregate care settings, uh, things like schools where people come together in large numbers. A couple other things uh, before we open it up for questions. Today, President Biden approved my request for a major disaster declaration in the Commonwealth of Kentucky and ordered federal assistance. Uh, this is about the severe storms, straight line winds, tornadoes, flooding, landslides, and mudslides from New Year's Eve, December 31st, 2021 to January 2nd, 2022. It's for the counties of Boyd, Breathitt, Carter, Christian, Clay, Floyd, Green, Johnson, Knott, Lawrence, Owsley, Pike, and Taylor counties. This is, we all have all learned these terms, the public assistance. And that's federal funding being available to the Commonwealth, the state itself, and eligible local governments and certain private nonprofit organizations for, co for costs and damages uh, that, that we endured as a result of that weather event. Uh, federal funding is available on a cost sharing basis for hazard mitigation measures for the entire Commonwealth as well. 
Those eligible should contact Kentucky Emergency Management for more information. We do not expect uh, that we will be granted any individual assistance from those New Year's Eve, New Year's Day uh, storms. Uh, that's something that we received with the major flooding in eastern Kentucky uh, over a year ago, as well as uh, for the tornadoes. But as a reminder, for those who suffered in the tornadoes, where individual assistance is available, your deadline to apply for FEMA assistance is Monday, March the 14th. Uh, and if we could put up the, the slide as well on, well, here, it's fine. You can apply by disasterassistance.gov, uh, by going to the app or by calling the phone number. March the 14th, um, make sure uh, that you meet uh, that time period. Uh, we continue to put more individuals into travel trailers. Again, we are uh, consolidating uh, some of our our survivors that we're taking care of in our state parks. We are moving from what I would call the emergency housing where we have people in hotels and state park lodges to more medium term housing, which just means that people are gonna get the option of, of going into a travel trailer or uh, finding uh, other uh, housing. But we are going to have to require those that wanna continue to accept help to move into that next phase. Uh, there are some that that you know uh, rightfully who are who are harmed, but but who are receiving uh, multiple meals a day, for instance, and in the lodges and in the motels that we need to take that extra step towards um, self-sufficiency and ultimately getting back uh, to to former routines by taking that intermediate housing step. And we are working with people directly on a daily basis to make that happen. Uh, we are. Uh, over 70% complete with debris removal outside of Graves County. And we're at about 40% on debris removal um, inside of Graves County. So uh, real progress being made, especially when you consider the total amount of debris that is there. I want to thank our local leadership uh, for doing such an incredible job. Uh, I got to see uh, Mayor Onan. Mayfield's mayor just uh, the end of last week. She was up both to, to talk to legislators and to attend Director Dossett's uh, retirement party. Today is his last day. We're excited about Colonel Slinker, who is taking over there and will help uh, us to take the, the next steps towards getting people back uh, into their home and into their lives. Uh, I don't have the talking points in front of me on it, but we also have another round of checks going out from the Team Kentucky Western Tornado, uh, Team Western Kentucky Tornado Relief Fund. This is for insured homeowners and renters. Uh, we'll put out a release about the total amounts. It's thousands of Kentuckians. It's meant to help them pay their deductible um, that they had to pay to receive uh, the funding uh, from their insurance company. It's gonna be millions of more dollars going out to them. Once we get through these rounds, the next step is going to directly assist on the rebuilding effort, working with primarily nonprofits that can bring people in to actually build these houses and to lessen any costs on our survivors in doing that. We want to be able to use to, we want to be able to use the funds we've got to leverage the speed, um, the ensuring we have the materials and and the size of the workforce to do as many of those as quickly as possible. Finally, two pieces of other good news, one from last week and one from today. Last Wednesday, I was proud to join Goodwill Industries of Kentucky and Norton Healthcare in West Louisville for what was one of my most memorable days as governor. We spent the morning celebrating what will be an incredible leap forward and a transformational investment in West Louisville for every resident that lives there. It was made possible by Goodwill and Norton, which are investing $100 million on a 20-acre parcel in West Louisville, creating an opportunity campus. $70 million is going to go, is going to come from Norton for the first compre comprehensive health care center in West Louisville, I think in 130 years. Access to health care is an issue of life and death, and so excited that that access is going to be in that community. Goodwill is putting $30 million in 
uh, to serve 50,000 people each year with programs and job training. It's also right next to our government center that is a regional driver's license and, and so many other services. We're going to have hundreds of jobs uh, in, in about a two-block area. It's going to be really exciting uh, what hap happens. Uh, average annual wage of $59,000 for the jobs that are down there. They're going to help more than 600 job seekers into full-time employment every year. Uh, major leap, major step. When we talk about being on the cusp of opportunity and needing to make sure it reaches every neighborhood, especially those that are too often left out, that's what's happening here. Wouldn't have happened without transformational leaders at Norton, at Goodwill, uh, and in the community itself that helped prepare uh, for this type of announcement. Yes. All right, uh, to put a couple numbers on the uh, uh, Team Western Kentucky Tornado Relief Fund, $5.7 million in assistant, assistance payments are going out the door over the next two weeks. It's gonna go to about 5,000 Kentuckians. Uh, they are reimbursement payments. They, they can cover up to $2,500 of out-of-pocket deductible payments. Uh, they are being uh, allocated to Kentuckians who made a tornado-related insurance claim in one of the 16 counties where FEMA declared a federal disaster. First wave of checks begins going out today, about 2,000 checks at $2.3 million. Second wave is going to go out on Monday. Next Monday, 2,943 checks at $3.4 million. This is on top of the $800,000 that's been paid out to help families cover funeral expenses. First thing we do is grieve together. And another $2 million in assistance has been sent out to uninsured renters and homeowners. Um, again, we're still accepting dollars into the fund. Uh, it's really gonna help us, especially now, that some of the organizations that are wonderful, that help in the immediate aftermath to meet emergency needs are moving on to help people in other areas struck by disasters. This is the fund, uh, team wkyreliefund.ky.gov, that's truly going to be the bridge uh, that helps us to rebuild every structure and every life. And finally, about 20 minutes before this press conference, I got back from Northern Kentucky, uh, where I signed a memorandum of understanding with my good friend, uh, Governor Mike DeWine, uh, on how we are going to build the Brent Spence Companion Bridge. It's a really important step for us to take to have the best application under the federal bipartisan infrastructure bill, where we're seeking about $2 billion um, through a, a couple of, of application processes. If we secure enough of that, we will move forward and build that companion bridge without tolls. Current Brent Spence Bridge, it is sturdy, it is structurally sound, but right now it has twice the number of vehicles crossing it every day as it was designed uh, to, to take. Uh, this is gonna create a companion bridge that is going to help, it's going to lessen congestion. Uh, this is one of the most important arteries in our entire infrastructure system in the United States. It's used by people from all different states. It is so important for the families in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky. I wanna thank uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, Congressman John Yarmuth, who both supported and voted for uh, the Infrastructure Act that's gonna make this possible. And I wanna thank in advance uh, the rest of our federal delegation who I know will push hard uh, to ensure we are awarded these funds. I also want to thank um, the strong support we've received from our state legislators, including Senate President Robert Stivers, House Speaker David Osborne, uh, certainly a lot of committee chairs and, and folks from the area itself, Covington Mayor Joe Meyer. We had a ton, um, a big bipartisan group of Northern Kentucky legislators and mayors, county judges that were there today, really excited. This is something that people said wasn't possible. And I believe we're closer than ever to getting it done. And we're going to get it done. A Brent Spence companion bridge without tolls. That'd be truly incredible. And I think it would be the lasting image of what the federal infrastructure bill has done. 
With that, we will open it up to questions. We'll start here in studio with Karen Zarr. Sure. This Sunday marks two years since the first table talk. I remember in the beginning you would show charts that were used to span us through of how parts of the country did. What do you hope, both positive and negative? What would you say about our journey? How well did we do? And what do you think will be said about Kentucky years from now? Yeah. So with the second year anniversary coming up, um, you know, I, th I think we've had a lot of success in how we have battled uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the initial projections were that we would lose a lot more Kentuckians than we have. But losing over 13,000 lives here in the Commonwealth and continuing to lose them is really hard. Um, I'm grateful for how Kentuckians responded. Uh, and certainly during the period that um, the executive branch had the ability uh, to take the, the additional steps that were required. And we had the courage to do so each time. Uh, I know that we were as successful as any other part of the country. I think when people look back on this, they'll see that um, when we had the authority, uh, we lost half as many lives per month uh, as when the, the General Assembly took over the management, took ownership of the, the pandemic. Um, so there's going to be a lot of lessons, I think, that can be learned from that. Um, but our people uh, fought so hard and have. Our local leadership, I think, has done their, their very best. Um, and I think we proved a lot of people wrong and opened up a lot of eyes about Kentucky. The main thing we had going for us is that we are good people that care about one another. I do think though that as we move forward, there's still a ton of grief to process. And I even think that some of the noise that's out there are, are, is really the processing of grief. You think about the stages of grief of anger and denial, and that's exactly what you see in the midst of, uh, of all this. So I believe, first of all, there's, there's still time to go until this won't be impacting our lives significantly. Um, and then there's gonna be a lot of healing that's needed. I mean, we think about the way we look back on the major wars that have taken so many lives of Kentuckians. This has taken more lives than any three of them put together. And so we've got scars externally and internally. And we're going to need to give ourselves room and time to process what we've been through in the years to come. Steve, you want? Okay. Tom Latek. I saw Kenneth here today, but this is not his fault. You want me to move to the next? Okay, what about Samantha Valentino from the UK Student News Network? All right, we're gonna give it just a minute. Otherwise, it's gonna be the best Q&A we've had at any one of these press conferences. Sure. Uh, I just have a practical comment, but I just saw a little bit on it. Mm -hmm. I know they're talking about um, the filing for bills now that would make gaming official in Kentucky. Your thoughts on that? Well, I, I have not seen the individual bills filed today uh, by Representative Koenig and others. Uh, certainly support uh, sports betting. It's time that we legalize it. You can do it in just about every state around us. People drive right over a bridge or, or a state line, place it on their phone and come back. Uh, you see it in commercials, even here in the state during sporting events. You know, it's time that we join the rest of the world for it. Um, I support full gaming though, and believe that it could be um, an even bigger economic driver. Uh, again, we're behind the times compared to other states with it. Okay, now we'll go to Tom Latek. Can you hear me now? I can. 
Oh, okay, great. Well, first of all, let me say I'm jealous. You can make it from Cincinnati to Frankfurt in 20 minutes. I was about an hour and a half for me. So uh, <laughs> well done for that. Uh, with the FEMA declaration, I was looking at some of the National Weather Service uh, sites and they show a number of other counties besides the 13 that are on this uh, disaster declaration announced today by FEMA. Um, are you looking to expand the list from that? Well, it, certainly you have to provide enough documentation and you have to reach a certain level of damage within each county and ultimately statewide to, to get this type of, of declaration. That includes us receiving the information and it being in a form that FEMA will accept. If we believe that we have enough uh, uh, documentation from a different county and public assistance hasn't been granted, then we'll either appeal and or we have in the past um, later filed for additional counties and it been granted or, or denied. Uh, so we, we go as far as the data can, can take us um, and, and certainly wanna make sure as many counties that have suffered harm are able to get help. All right, Samantha Valentino, UK Student News Network. Okay, April record, WFPL. Thank you very much. Governor, what's your response to the resolution last week uh, to end the state of emergency March 7? How do you feel about that? And could it affect <clears throat> could it affect anything like your use of National Guard or requesting federal funds? Well, we're still losing hundreds of Kentuckians a week. Because I'm as happy as anybody else that cases are dropping. Positivity rate is dropping, but we still have a pandemic that while we have to live with, we can't simply ignore. Um, you know, it, it, this, is, this is something that we've got to approach with science and with reason. And we don't have any real restrictions that apply in people's daily life right now. Uh, so I think what's being done is more about politics when we need uh, the, the flexibility for reimbursement. Uh, to potentially be able to deploy the guard if we need them uh, again. And remember, uh, the state of emergency that is that, that the resolution would end is the state of emergency that the same body extended uh, just weeks earlier. You know, I think what's at play, as far as I can tell from the outside, is individual elections and pressure uh, that people are facing. Now, let's, let's do the smart thing. Um, we don't have, we're fully open for business. We've been fully open for business. Our economy is booming again, best year for economic development ever last year, but hospitals crying out for help at different points that may need help again. And let's not do anything that, that could stop us uh, at any point from getting reimbursement for things that we need. Uh, Sarah Ladd, Courier Journal. Yes, thank you. Um, does Kentucky have any plans to start banning Russian products like alcohol? I know some other states have um, started doing that given what's happening in Ukraine. Thanks. Well, first, we are strongly supportive of the Ukrainian people. I put out a statement um, about the morning after the invasion um, and encouraging all Kentuckians and all Americans to stay unified. Uh, that morning, I said that we were imposing the most severe sanctions I believe the world has ever seen, and we are starting to see them cripple the Russian economy. So to Kentuckians and Americans, we need to stay strong when we see impacts on our daily life, knowing that those impacts are uh, ultimately um, likely, even at this point with the sanctions, to stop this aggression. And us sacrificing a little bit, cost of gas, maybe a few other things uh, could be the real difference uh, in crippling uh, the Russian economy and preventing them from continuing these acts of aggression. Uh, we'll look at steps that other states took. You know, most vodkas that have a Russian name aren't made in Russia anymore or owned by, by Russian companies. Uh, so we would want any step that we take to be meaningful and, and hope that 
um, as opposed to symbolic steps, which are which are good too. Uh, there are strong statements of support uh, and are digging in, uh, knowing that there'll be some changes in our daily lives, uh, but that those changes uh, can help protect uh, a people that are being attacked and could prevent a future attack is, is really uh, important. Uh, let me just add also, if the, if the federal government reaches out for any help uh, on any uh, activity in Kentucky that they can believe, that they believe will be helpful, we are absolutely there. Uh, we are 100% supportive uh, of the sanctions. We wanna be unified as Americans, but also with Europe and so many uh, other countries. We're proud to stand with so many allies of freedom and democracy. Uh, Jessica Payne, Murray, Ledger and Times. Thank you, Governor. Uh, the CDC's community levels are designed on uh, to consider the strain on the healthcare system. However, they're only based on COVID hospitalizations. So are there any concerns about the overall hospital capacity and ICU capacity, ventilator use, those things not being included among the indicators? And then my other question well, is, uh, do you think that the new targeted approach by county will increase the compliance if and when uh, situations deteriorate? Thank you. Uh, first, on the overall hospitalizations, it's something we are going to watch. You know, we, we have our map that we show at different times that shows overall ICUs and the amount of beds uh, in it. Certainly, the, the new guidance and what the CDC does is looking at the prevalence of COVID by the, the amount of people hospitalized for it. Uh, but you can, in, in addition to that, and, and the color-coded maps and the rest, we are in constant contact with our hospitals. And um, if we need to make changes based on a lack of space, we will absolutely do so. So this is just like anything else we've had. It's the best tool and guidance we have at the moment, but it's certainly not the only thing uh, that we are looking at. And even with regions and, and how uh, they communicate with us and the information, um, being able to be flexible. Now, certainly having the state of emergency would allow us to augment uh, the, the personnel levels in certain regions if it was necessary. Without it, it's gonna be pretty hard. Melissa Patrick, Kentucky Health News. Um, hi, Gavin. I have uh, two questions. They may be for Dr. Stack. Not sure. Uh, the first is when and how often see that the one is to be a two self variant, as new studies show, it's more transmissible um, than the original Omicron, but may not be as severe. And how much of this variant are we seeing in Kentucky? Okay, I'll, I'll turn that over to, to Dr. Stack. I forgot to answer um, Jessica's second question on county compliance. We always hope that having more specific and more targeted guidance will help with compliance. We just need a commitment by our local leaders, but also all our individual uh, families uh, that I know are relieved um, to, to have you know, new guidance um, at the same time while we learn to live with COVID, we cannot ignore it. And these are hopefully um, minor changes to make in our regular lives. Certainly they are less severe changes than what we've had to do the last two years. Dr. Stack. I, you were cutting out, but I think the first question was when we'll update things. And thank you for asking that because I passed over that line in my remarks. Starting next week, we're going to switch to a weekly updating cadence for all these major metrics. And so uh, there won't be daily case reports or daily positivity reports and things of that nature. We'll go to weekly, which is really what the trend is across all the states and generally what the CDC is moving to as well. The CDC will update that indicator map we showed once a week and we'll update our statistics once a week. It's much more appropriate as we look to start the third year of the pandemic. It gives timely information, but it's also responsive to the realities of where we are. Uh, the second thing about the BA2 variants for Omicron, 
Uh, it still is in low single digits nationwide. So as of today, the most recent number on the CDC's webpage is about 3.8% of all of the COVID in the United States of America is the BA2 version, which they named, quote, the stealth variant because it doesn't show up unusually on one, on one or two of the uh, laboratory tests that we use. Uh, you know, the guidance is the same. Uh, you have to get vaccinated, you have to get boosted, you have to stay home if you're sick you know, or if you test positive for COVID, we should wear masks in a targeted fashion still uh, for people who are at high risk. And we need to, in schools, use things like test to stay uh, and in our general lives, use antigen tests that we hopefully will be able to see in a much more affordable price and paid for by insurance and others um, per the president of the United States' uh, orders in place at the moment. So we use tools to keep ourselves safe. It really doesn't matter what the future variants are unless they radically change entirely unlike the previous COVID. We have to do those sorts of things. Uh, and, and generally it's not terribly valuable to speculate in, uh, so much on some of these variants because we've seen some previous variants run through whole countries and cause major problems and never take off here. Uh, and in this case, the BA2 still remains an uncertainty uh, that so far looks to spread more easily, but not to cause more severe damage. So for right now, I think the guidance that we showed today is what I'd urge everyone to do. All right, uh, with our last question, Corinne Boyer, WEKU. Hi, Governor. Most of Kentucky is still in the mask up zone according to that latest CDC data. Is it too early to make masks masks optional in state offices. And then I know I asked you a question about utilities last week, but I've been hearing from a lot of people that they've been getting $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 bills. Um, and they're concerned because they've never seen them this high. Are you concerned about these stories? And will your administration look into it? Thank you. Yeah, I'm concerned about the, the price uh, of utility bills, especially in eastern Kentucky. And so, yes, uh, actively looking at that. Also concerned about uh, rents going up in areas where the tornado hit. I know folks have reached out uh, to the attorney general um, discussing price gouging on that, though I have not talked uh, to the attorney general. Real good question on the, the state uh, office buildings with most of Kentucky still in the red. I want to be clear that we have recommended to people that they follow the state guidance, that they see they're in a red county and they base their decisions on that. Now, we've, we've been requiring our state employees to mask longer than just uh, about uh, certainly any other uh, private sector folks um, in, in the area. And people have held on and I really appreciate them, them doing that. And we've asked them to do it for a really long time. So what we've always talked about is the effectiveness of any approach is, is how good the policy uh, is times the number of people who follow it. And I think we're at a point now where we felt we had to make this change, but at the same time, we're making it in a nuanced way. Uh, certainly the congregate settings, which is a whole lot like a school. It's about the number of people that are close uh, together for long periods of time are still uh, going to be uh, masking. Uh, so listen, we, we believe in the science and we encourage people uh, to follow the recommendations, uh, whether de depending on whether your county is in the red, yellow, or green in the CDC. Uh, but we're facing a, a, a reality where people have all that information uh, now uh, in a time when our numbers are, are, are tumbling as well. Uh, so you know, if everybody, out there, we're, we're going to be much lower than we are this week, next week. We're going to be a whole lot lower than where we are this week in two weeks. So again, be empowered to make that decision. Uh, don't be worried if you choose to continue to wear a mask. If you look around and you feel like you're the only person wearing it, keep wearing it, right? That was your decision for you. And you should get to do, um, uh, you should get to protect yourself to that level that, that you decide. I think you'll see a number of state employees continuing in public settings uh, to wear them. Uh, but listen, we've been wearing them in private meetings too, uh, smaller groups, 100% vaccinated groups for a long time now. Uh, so we'd, we'd, we'd run about as, as, as far and as long as we can. Um, and, and I'm just, I'm really grateful. 
I'm really grateful to our state employees, how we were able to get through the Omicron surge, the most uh, contagious virus of our lifetimes and not have to shut down a single service for one full day. Um, appreciate Dr. Stack and his group providing the guidance and, and appreciate everybody uh, hanging on. Again, exciting. The numbers are decreasing. Everybody, please review this information. You make the best decision you can uh, for you. Don't feel pressure uh, from those around you. Uh, we'll be back on Thursday with a Team Kentucky update that'll go through a whole lot more, including some great economic development news we had at the end of last week and many more jobs set to come. Thank you.